servant leadership. No matter what the role is within the body of Jesus Christ, leaders are to allow others who are more qualified than they are to emerge as the prominent leaders. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. This principle is illustrated in a very fascinating way in the life of Barnabas and Saul. And let me use that as the first sequence. And so let's take a look at what happened when these five men agreed or the others agreed that the Holy Spirit was speaking and said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Well, it happened. And so let's pick up the geographical event. They left Antioch, went to Seleucia, boarded ship, and went on to Cyprus. And there they came to the city of Salamis. And let me simply say that Cyprus was Barnabas' home state or home island. That's where he was born and he lived and where he grew up. And that's why he was a a God-fearing Grecian Jew. He understood the Greek mindset because he grew up on the island of Cyprus. Now, eventually, he became a very successful businessman and bought property in Jerusalem. And remember, he sold one of his fields uh, to give the money to help support the church and to feed the people in the early days of the church. Now he's back home after all these years where he grew up. But this time, Saul is with him. He's still called Saul. So they land, they go to the city of Salamis, and they cross the island. And when they came to Paphos, this city, on the western side of the island, something really interesting happened. A false prophet appears. Notice Acts chapter 13. When they had traveled the whole island, as far as Paphos, now they may have stopped along the way and done various things, but what Luke wants us to know is what happened when they crossed all the way over to Paphos. Luke gives us the statement about what happened. They came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. By the way, isn't it interesting that it was true prophets there in Antioch that got the message from the Holy Spirit to send them out, that is, Barnabas and Saul. Now, here they meet a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the Word of God. In the process of all this happening, we're going to see something happen here that changes Who is the primary leader on this apostolic team? Notice. Here's what we read in verse 8. But Elamus, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now notice what happened. It's going to be something very unique in terms of capability. But Saul also called Paul. And by the way, this is the first time in Luke here that he's called Paul. The first time. Something's happening with the change of name. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elamus and said, You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. What Saul is doing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit is reading this man's heart. He didn't have that capability on his own, as none of us do. But Saul had it at this moment. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You're going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Again, you have this miraculous situation. In a sense, what Paul is doing here is pronouncing blindness on this man. That's an incredible miracle. A very unique capability experience. And notice, immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then when he saw what happened, the proconsul believed because 
He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And we might say he was not only astonished by the teaching of the Lord, by the affirmation of the teaching of the Lord through that miraculous, unique intervention in his life involving the sorcerer. Now, you see, what's happening here at this point in time, Barnabas realizes that Paul has a particular, a particular calling that was different from his calling. Paul was demonstrating the signs of an apostle, namely those men that God had chosen initially that we call apostles. Paul testified to that when he wrote to the Corinthians. He said, the signs of an apostle were performed with unfailing endurance among you, including signs and wonders and miracles. And that's exactly what God, the Holy Spirit, is demonstrating through the Apostle Paul in this event when he confronts this false prophet. You see, at this point in time, leadership roles changed. Barnabas recognized that God had called Paul to be the great apostle to the Gentiles. And from this point forward, basically, it wasn't Barnabas and Paul, it was Paul and Barnabas. That name sequence is very, very important as you look at Scripture. For example, in Acts 13, 13, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga, in Pamphylia. But John left them and went back to Jerusalem. In other words, they got on the ship and they continued their journey from Cyprus and went to Perga. Now, once they arrived there, John, by the way, in a sense, bailed out because he knew what lay ahead as they climbed the mountains from Perga to Pisidia and Antioch because that was a a journey of several days up in the mountains. It was blistering hot in the daytime, freezing at the at night. Furthermore, thieves and criminals were along the path. And John said, I can't handle this, and went back to Jerusalem. That's another story. But Paul and Barnabas went on to Pisidia and Antioch. Now, when they got there, notice what we have. Notice the sequence. They went in the synagogue. Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and said, Fellow Israelites, and you who fear God, listen. Who's, in, who's the primary leader now? It's Paul. Barnabas recognizes that, and he supports that. Notice, as you read on in the story, in Acts 13, 43, after the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who were speaking with them and are urging them to continue in the grace of God. Notice another event in verse 46. Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. They're responding to the Jews who are asking questions. And then notice in Acts 13, 51, but Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went on then to Iconium. What I want you to see here is that a transition takes place in relationship to what happened on this first missionary journey. See, God does have roles. And when those roles are fulfilled, we see it in the Scriptures, who actually had the prominent role. Paul emerged as the prominent leader of this missionary team, and Barnabas was a thousand percent supportive. He knew God was at work. We see the same thing happening in the New Testament. Remember when the church was born, again and again in the book of Acts, we read Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John. That sequence is important because Peter was the leader of the apostles. And John became his associate. Now the important thing here to notice is remember that John and his brother James, who was martyred, before they really became committed to Jesus Christ, they were the two guys who came and they tried to do an end run around Peter. 
and said to Jesus, we want to be on the right and on the left when you come into your kingdom. And you remember what Jesus said, can you drink the cup? The cup that I'm going to drink? And James being the spokesman says we can. And by the way, he drank that cup, but he never really understood at that moment what the cup was going to be. His life was at that point transformed. But you see, God's will in this situation is that it was Peter, the primary leader. God prepared him for that. And John then became his associate. And we see that again and again with name sequence in the opening part of the book of Acts. So let me just state that principle again, and then we'll come back to the question for application. No matter what the role is within the body of Jesus Christ, leaders are to allow others who are more qualified than they are to emerge as the prominent leaders. And we see that happening in this particular situation. Now, having said that, here's the reflection and response question. Why is it so difficult for primary spiritual leaders to allow others more qualified to step into a prominent role? When have you actually seen this happen? I think we're all vulnerable as leaders. You know, even in the family situation, if we're not careful. But particularly in roles where we have a prominent leadership role, it's very, very easy for us to develop a sense of security in our role. I've seen this happen. I've seen that happen to fellow pastors. Because what happens is ego gets into the situation. And we're not willing to step aside in situations where definitely there needs to be someone to replace us. And so consequently, this is a very, very important principle. I remember as I was nearing passing the baton myself, that there was a guiding principle that uh, came to me, and I call this a principle, but at least it's a guideline. And it was simply this, when I need the church more than the church needs me, I've stepped over the line. I've seen that happen to pastors who ought to pass the baton or step aside because there's an Apostle Paul quote, unquote, that's going to step into that lead role. When I need the church more than the church needs me, I've stepped over the line. And I've seen some fellow pastors who have not recognized, evidently, that their sense of security and position and ego needs the position more than those in that group need that leader. And so we have to be very, very careful. It's a very significant principle that God gives us here. On the other hand, God wants us to be servant leaders. Not just leaders who have a role. When Paul stepped into that lead role, all the way through his ministry, he became a servant leader. And that's what Jesus taught. He that is greatest is servant of all. Remember when he washed the disciples' feet? When Peter and John had prepared that meal and they forgot to get a servant and Jesus waited into the middle of the meal to see if one of those rascals would volunteer to be the servant. Not one of them did and they knew the servant was missing and not one of them, the, the bull was there and the towel was there and not one of them went and Jesus waited purposely to the middle of the meal and he went over and he took the bowl. And that's why Peter was so embarrassed when he came to Peter and said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. You see, Peter knew that he should have volunteered to be the servant. After all, Jesus was preparing him to be the leader of the apostles. Why didn't he go over and take that towel? He's the one, and along with John, who forgot to get the servant. And after Jesus had washed their feet, he made a powerful statement. And I believe he looked everyone up these men in the eye and said, and we read about it, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, 
And I looked, I think he looked right at Peter, he looked at John, he looked in the eye and said, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. You're speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. And there, what Jesus is actually saying is, he that is greatest among you is servant of all.